732, and I want to welcome everyone to the light board meeting for August 23rd. Um, first item on the agenda is uh, meetings and minutes. Uh, so our next meeting is the 13th of September. Uh, and we did have some minutes go around. I was, I got them in plenty of time, but unfortunately, I don't think I've read them. Um, so, uh, have others reviewed the minutes for, uh, let me get the date right. I unfortunately have not read them. I saw that they came, but I've been traveling. Yeah, same here. Sorry. So. I, I'm going to defer minutes to the next meeting because it is only a couple of weeks away. So uh, we'll we'll catch up then. I want to thank Karen though for getting them out promptly, and this time yes. it was our our fault for not getting them read and reviewed on time. So thank I, you, Karen. I, yeah, that was that's we've we've got a better hold on minutes now with the the system that we put in place. Um. Well, before we go to the director's update, I, I've heard that Mary uh, will, has to leave by 8.30 and she's our select board liaison and has a, has a public comment to make. So I'm gonna allow her to, to make a statement before we get started on the director's update. Uh, Mary? Thank you, Brian, I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I just wanted to let people know that the solar um, task force has been impaneled and they had their first meeting Oh, about two weeks ago, um, Laura gave a great grounding of um, what prior um, <laughs> attempts to put municipal um, on municipal and put solar on municipal land and why they what kind of obstacles they ran into. So that was a good grounding. I think the team has to go deeper into that and understand what are the obstacles. But I think we got off to a great start. It's a great group of people. They're very motivated. So I just wanted to give you an update on that, that that's up and running and so far looking really good. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, the um, 40B development that's going in off of Baker Ave, it's called Novo Riverside Commons. Uh, we had a site visit there a few weeks ago. And one of the big advantages of this for the town is that it's gonna be all electric. They're gonna use electric for heat and power. Um, and so, um, heat and cooling, sorry. And we had a site visit and there were a lot of questions from the people in the, in the group around um, the electrification and if the grid could handle it. And there was no one there from CMLP to field those questions. And I know that there are a lot of conversations going on behind the scenes with the developer to make sure that that will, that will happen. It's just that during that particular public discussion there was no reassurance. So what happened is, is that people in the audience started to um, you know, volunteer answers to some of the questions that were coming up. So there's another site visit um, scheduled, I think it's scheduled sometime in late October. And I would really hope that someone from CMLP is there to field these types of questions. And that's all I got, thank you. Uh, Dave, it, for the general, concern over electrification and can the grid handle it? What is your general response, uh, you know, as the director? So we have we have capacity to take on more electrification. Um, in that particular project, we've been working with the contractor and the developer for a long time. Um, for that project, the solar storage, the whole, whole thing. So um, they're aware of what we can handle and what we can't. In terms of general electrification, we have to keep a close eye on it because uh, if every structure in town went to electric and everyone had EVs, we would probably have a capacity issue and have to go um, look at transmission upgrades and things like that. So, you know, we got to keep a close eye on it as as electrification happens, but we do have some cap capacity right now to to handle some growth. Yeah, and and I do, I think the growth happens over time and we'll have plenty of time when, when capacity starts to get short uh, we can look at ways to increase capacity but right now you know the general concern is we shouldn't do things because the grid can't handle it and i and i think the answer is you know the grid today can handle it for our capacity but if we were to do it very quickly we could have some issues 
but we don't, I mean, the idea that everybody would suddenly electrify in a year or two and that we'd have those issues is, is kind of an outlier example possible, but, you know, not practical, not, not realistic. Yeah. We have about 30% capacity available on the substation itself. Another 10 megawatts on top of that um, in terms of what the station can handle, but uh, under contract with Eversource is 60 uh, megawatts. And, you know, our peak in, in the summer right now is just less than 40. So there's room, but like I said, that, that capacity could go quick if, if we had wild adoption. Yeah. And, uh, and we could do more projects like solar and storage projects and other things behind the substation to help manage that. But that's, that's a cost function. That's, you know, that costs us money to put up the capital to do that. Anyway, last, uh, so summary is don't let the concerns about the grid slow progress, but we'll keep an eye on it when capacity gets tight. Um, all right, uh, Dave, would you like to do the director's update? It's been six or seven weeks, so it's going to be quite an update. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, sent out the update yesterday um, from the energy management side. Uh, we had uh, an article about heating and cooling um, coaching appear in the uh, August 18th edition of the bridge. Uh, so hopefully you guys saw that. It featured comments from uh, coaching clients about their experience using the service um, and heating uh, their homes with heat pumps um, and the coaches and mentioned the projected carbon-free power for 2023. So we like that. Um, so, you know, that was good. Um, gas heating businesses in Concord that switch to uh, heat pumps are eligible for the mass save weatherization rebates, um, right. as well as um, the mass save heat pump rebates. So um, that's that's a great thing and we're hoping people take uh, advantage of it. Um, as of August 20th, um, we have uh, about 247 um, uh, Concordians signed up uh, for the EV test drive event. Um, that we're holding on October 1st. So we got some really good um, uh, numbers on that. I think that's higher than than we've had in the past. So um, we're excited about that. Um, we're, you know, in into the middle school solar storage project pretty deep at this point. Um, the staff has been meeting with the general contractor, the architect, uh, the project manager, uh, our electrical consultant, PLM, um, and Solar Design Associates, obviously, uh, another one of our uh, consultants. Um, PLM is working on the switchgear design um, as well as the fault coordination study. So those are two big pieces um, that we've outsourced and, and rightfully so. Um, SDA has been working um, on the request for proposal for the solar and storage systems as well as the canopy design. Um, Coordination between the roof manufacturer and Solar Design Associates um, has been ongoing. You know, we're we're trying to um, you know select the appropriate manufacturer that lines up with the roofing manufacturer to uh, minimize the number of penetrations in the roof. So that's been ongoing and pretty important uh, piece to the project. Um, we're in the process of working with um, the ZBA to do the um, permitting for the uh, waiver for the setback. Uh, currently the setback's 40 feet and we're looking to get that adjusted based on our project. Um, there's no guarantees that we'll get that waived. So um, SDA has also prepared um, a second model in the event that that setback, setback waiver isn't granted. Um, we feel like we have a, a pretty good shot at that uh, based on meeting with um, planning and land management um, based on our needs. So uh, the good news is um, with the projected loads that we've received le uh, recently um, and looking at the second um, alternative, if the setback isn't granted um, or waiver isn't granted, uh, it would still end up being net zero. So, you know, we're, st we're still meeting the goal, um, but we do, we do uh, want to get that waiver for the setback. Um, 
We've also met with the electrical contractor, and that's a pretty important piece of the project um, for the line extension. So, you know, we're coming from the overhead system into um, the utility area uh, on the middle school project, and we've issued uh, our plans for that, and those get transferred into the architect's plans, and sometimes they don't always match. Um, that's been our experience over the years. So we've met with them and we want to make sure that all the line extension conduits are put in and meet um, our specifications so that there's no issues um, as we move forward. So there's a lot going on there, a lot of time being consumed, um, but a lot of uh, positive progress. Uh, you may remember um, at the last meeting um, or the meeting prior to that, I can't remember which one it was, I had mentioned that we went out for bids for transformers and um, we only had three um, bids. None of the, the main suppliers in the US um, bid based on some of the specifications and the changes in the in industry. So we reviewed, we reviewed the bids that we did receive and um, each of them took exception and um, it was not favorable. So we decided not to award the bid. Um, we are in the process of modifying the bid documents and we'll issue a new bid. Um, our expectations are that we'll get, you know, some of those larger transformer manufacturers to participate based on the feedback that we got from them. Um, so that's going to, that's going to go out relatively soon. And, um, you know, hopefully we get a little better pricing and lead times. You may recall the lead times, uh, on the last bids were anywhere from one to three years. And, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty, pretty difficult, um, scenario to operate under, you know, because we usually go off for transformer bids a couple times a year. Um, we do have a decent amount of stock for reserves. Um, but, you know, as, as customers electrify, as Brian was referring to earlier, that generally requires a transformer upgrade. And so that starts to deplete the stock. So um, we're okay right now, but we do have to keep an eye on it. And, um, Hopefully, you know, rebidding this uh, works out favorably for um, the light plant and, and our rate payer. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, <clears throat> we Every three years, we normally have an open house during Public Power Week at the light plant. And we are engaged here with the staff um, on planning uh, an open house in October. Um, it's usually well attended, um, well received by uh, the public. And um, it's currently scheduled for October 14th between 10 and 2 p.m. Um, so we haven't done one in several years. And primarily that was because of the pandemic. Um, so I think it's been maybe four or five years since we've done one. So we have a lot of new faces. So, you know, planning it out and, and you know, making sure we um, are able to highlight a lot of the good things that we're working on is uh, important to the staff and, and us. And given that it's our 125th anniversary, we thought it was probably appropriate. Um, so hopefully everyone can attend that. Um, and the other thing you may recall that uh, I mentioned our latest uh, bucket truck was delayed um, in the manufacturing. We actually did go out and look at it um, a couple of weeks ago. And that's, um, that's a hybrid bucket truck. It'll be the first one in the fleet and it's supposed to be delivered um, this month. So I would say given that we're at the end of the month, it would probably be in within a couple of weeks. Uh, this truck is replacing a 1992 International. Uh, so the truck's replacing a 30 year old um, vehicle and um, we're excited. So that'll, that'll um, you know, bring our oldest truck offline and a, and a new one on, so. Um, also, for the board members, um, you know, we have the DPU report that needs to be signed. So um, if you guys could find some time to come in and, and sign off on that, that would be great. It's due in September, uh, late in September. So we have a little bit of time and we need to have at least three board members sign it. So um, I believe Karen sent something out on that. Um, so um, that's that. The last thing, Brian, you had mentioned, um, I believe at the last meeting, um, about uh, going to hybrid meetings. Um, 
and the public meeting room is almost set up for the technology. We have a couple more pieces. So I'm hoping within a meeting or two to be ready for that. We're just waiting for um, an AV company to give us um, some guidance on the microphones and things like that and cameras. Other than that, it's um, it's ready to go. So if you still you know want to go in that direction, we're working towards it. So I just wanted to update you on that. Great. It would be nice to see people in, you know, face to face. I haven't done that for a while. Um, I have a, I have a couple questions. Uh, yep. So the EV event, um, I know that there has been a lot of interest um, as we see interest in certain aspects, maybe the ride and drives are, are fully signed up or so forth. Can we go back to the dealers and increase the the number of vehicles available such that everyone that wants a ride can get a ride? Yeah, we certainly can go back and ask. Um, I'll, I'll check with Jan and see okay. uh, what her input is on that, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, because I know that uh, when we did this a few years ago, pre-pandemic, um, it got very, very high interest and I think it was fully signed up. And then it happened to coincide with a football event. And we had a lot of walk-ups that, that wanted to get in on ride and drives. Yep. Um, the setback and waivers on the um, middle school, uh, do you know the the capacity loss uh, if we don't get that waiver? You said that it would still reach net zero, um, but how significant would the the size of the system be reduced if we... Uh, so I, ju I just got the summary on that, Brian, that it you was still net zero. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But okay. I can get that to you and send it to you. Great. Um, and then the transformer bids. Um, when's the what's the deadline on uh, hearing responses to the second round um, on this? So once we uh, some you know issue the bid, it's usually two to three weeks before we um, require the bids to be due. So I would think we're going to probably be you know four or five weeks before we have gotten bids and reviewed them and are ready to hopefully make a recommendation to move forward. Okay, so probably late September, early October. That's that's probably reasonable to put that time on it. Um, Warren, you have a question. Yes, on the transformer bids, can you explain how you're changing it and why that's going to make a difference and getting responses? Yeah, so with the, the lead times being as long as they are, our standard um, is to have firm pricing um, and none of the manufacturers are doing that anymore because, you know, they can, they're going to put a bid in, but they need to have an escalator. And we basically used our standard language saying no escalators. So we're going to modify that language so that we get bids and we can review them accordingly and, and go from there. We checked with the state on what we could and couldn't do with that. So we have the parameters set. So that there's a couple different options, but that's really the big difference is the the firm pricing when they're uh, issued and then what the actual costs are going to be three years later. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? Uh, seeing none, it looks like we're ready to move on. Um, so I'd like to go to um, the broadband update. Uh, Jason, are you on? I I am. Yep. Excellent. Oh, there he is. Hello. It's like tic-tac-toe. You got to find the right square. Um, All right. Thank you. It's good to see everyone. Uh, I missed last month. I was out of town. Um, thank you, Dave, for filling in for me. Um, as Dave mentioned on that public meeting room, I have been working with AV companies on uh, figuring out how to get the cameras and microphones set up in an easy way so that uh, we can run the meeting ourselves without requiring a videographer, which sometimes is difficult to book, especially early in the morning. So I'm excited to see what they come back with for a design uh, and it should be simple and easy to use and also yield really good results. So, um, so we did have a network engineer that we had hired in the end of July. Uh, unfortunately, that person has departed already. Uh, we were only staffed fully for three weeks. Um, it really was a salary thing. The person while interviewing was uh, offered a job after they took this job and they really did enjoy the work and offered to stay on as a contractor um, or work on weekends or nights, but um, that's kind of not really what the role requires. So it's good to know that the, the role was a good fit for them, but just that 
unfortunately, we were not as competitive as what the private sector is with fully remote work and um, salaries that are much, much higher. I think that um, with the what we saw after the class and comp had finished in terms of applicants, we were in a much better place than what we were for the previous six to nine months. So we're optimistic that once this gets re-advertised uh, with HR, then we'll get a good applicant pool and hopefully hire somebody more quickly. The other thing that happened in the class and comp is that we added a senior network engineer position. So we do have the latitude if we find somebody who's more qualified to move them into that role or also provide a growth opportunity for somebody that we do hire. I know that employees that we hire in all sorts of roles, um, you know, they they might like working here, but after a few years, they might feel like there's an opportunity for growth. So having uh, senior titles and, you know, a lot of different fields is, is helpful. Um, the demand and interest in broadband is steady. It's good to see um, every month when I do the numbers for the monthly update that's posted on the on the website. Uh, it's good to see that, you know, as we come out of spring and move into summer, that people who are interested in signing up for broadband, that that those numbers remain steady year over year. We're not seeing a drop in interest, which is good. Uh, we also saw fewer disconnects this summer than last summer, which makes sense because uh, the vast majority of our disconnects are people who are moving away. In fact, it's very rare for people to cancel broadband for a reason other than the fact that they're moving. Um, and that just really reflects the real estate market and rising interest rates and fewer people uh, moving out. Um, we are seeing an uptick in people who are uh, moving to the faster speeds. So if you'll remember in January of this year, we did increase speeds up to one gig per second, both up and down for residential and uh, business customers. And I think in the uh, monthly update, I mentioned somewhere between 26 and 28, people have moved to those new rates. Some of them are new customers who sign up at a faster rate. Others are um, people who moved from a slower rate to a faster rate. And we are hearing from some of our new customers that their interest has been driven by our ability to offer these speeds, which is really good. Um, and we are monitoring the utilization. And at this point, based on the trends, we're not seeing a need to alter or upgrade hardware sooner than we would have otherwise. So we're kind of at the end of our current hardware generation and, and ready to um, add a new generation of equipment. Um, but that's going to be sort of a rolled out um, process. We wanted to make sure that adding these new speeds didn't require us to expend any capital sooner than we would have. And those numbers look good right now. So that's that's good to hear. Um, we've been working a lot with CMLP staff as well as Eaton, the uh, AMI meter vendor to get the AMS system deployed and make sure that we have the network set up for the IP link meters. If you'll recall, these are a, a some, small subset of meters that have the ability to not use the traditional 900 megahertz uh, wireless and, and sort of connect through the broadband infrastructure. So that requires a lot of technical changes and configurations and security considerations. So we've had several meetings with Eaton on that to keep that project moving forward. Um, and another work we're doing, the town network is, has been undergoing a very significant upgrade for the last several months. We're sort of at the tail end of that. The broadband technicians and the network engineers play a big role in that when we come, it comes to a network closet or data center cleanup. The time that the network, that the uh, telecom technicians work on this, we are, the town is paying for that, you know, so this is revenue generation from these employees that are doing the work. It's not just the enterprise lending, um, you know, a hand to the, the town. So, um, but I just want to really thank all of the staff. They have been working really hard to not have this extra work impact installs and walkthroughs and things like that. And so they've been doing a really good job at uh, very tightly scheduling things so that it allows them a little bit of time or on um, you know rainy days or days when we just don't have any installs to work on these projects. So that's going really well. And we're, like I said, probably about a month away from like the final cutover. Um, and then I just want to mention, you know, it's summertime, people are out sick, they're on vacation and uh, the team is doing a really good job with resilience. Uh, I saw yesterday, Dale, our broadband manager, was at a customer's house swapping out a piece of equipment uh, so that somebody didn't have to cancel an install. And I just appreciate teamwork like that, that uh, it keeps customers happy and keeps things moving. So I just want to give a shout out to all the staff. And that's all I had for my update. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Um, I have one quick question. Um, so on the network position, um, 
he was only in the role for three weeks. Um, it, do we have to restart the full process or was there an alternate candidate that we could reach out to? Yeah, we so we did review candidates. Uh, there was one alternate. They have since already got a job. So, um, okay. so we had we, to start will, over. Yeah. All right. Uh, Alice. Thanks. Um, as we were talking about the growth of broadband, I'm wondering whether we have reached out to the developer of the project on Baker Ave or, or other large projects going into pre-deploy the lines needed for options for broadband. Yes, absolutely. We are. We have met internally to discuss that, and we are planning to make sure that whatever building gets built, we absolutely have the conduit and the infrastructure necessary to make sure that all those units have broadband, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. So um, we've already talked to Calix, the hardware vendor that we use about these projects, uh, because it's been rare for us to get into the ground floor. So we are aware of that and mindful of it, and we will be working with the developer on that. That's great to hear. Thanks. Great. Uh, any other questions from the board? Uh, hearing none uh, or seeing none, I will have us move on to a discussion about second meter charges. Uh, Dave, do you want to lead this or you want to have Laura lead this? Uh, Matt's going to start the discussion. Um, oh, great. All right. Well, I will give it over to Matt. Good morning. Uh, I'm Matt Cummings, the financial manager. Um, you're going to have to hear me drool on for a couple topics today. Uh, Dave, can you let me uh, share the screen, please? Yep, go ahead. Okay. You should see a uh, PDF with some numbers on it. Um, so we put together a some figures based on the discussion last week uh, about seeing, you know, numbers around the philosophy that we were discussing. Um, we put together a few scenarios. Uh, scenario one just in, only includes costs that we attributed you know, solely to meters. Um, in scenario two, we added to that the billing costs associated with uh, billing meters. And then in the third scenario, we added in the energy, efficiency, energy efficiency costs, which is the CARES as well as some other other things. Um, <clears throat> and then we also, for the fourth scenario, we I gave what it would be if we collected, uh, so the, the power cost would be collected through the energy charge and then everything else besides power cost would be collected through a fixed charge. And this is just for reference, just so you know, we know how, what kind of cost we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> the, Top part for the first three scenarios, I, I used anticipated future capital costs. This is what we expect the meter capital to be after this the, the new meters go into place. Uh, and we we're using 15 years for the useful life uh, and that produces 190,000 annual depreciation costs for, uh, on strictly the meters. <clears throat> Uh, and then moving down, uh, we, I use the 2022 audited numbers, which we'll go over in the next topic. Um, <clears throat> the first line is meter maintenance and software. This is a little bit of labor cost, but it's mostly made up of uh, what our, in, our monthly annual Eaton cost will be for subscription and all that type of stuff. Um, the second line, meter department salaries, that's pretty... Uh, obvious. Same thing with customer service salaries. We kind of took percentages of certain folks' salaries and, and attributed what what portion they they did of their job re revolved around meters and then billing and then energy efficiency. Uh, administrative salaries. This includes more than just the admin folks, but it's just about just basically every everybody else that we attributed a little bit of salary to um, that went into these numbers. And then uh, down here, energy efficiency costs. This is in the third scenario. This is pretty much our CARES budget that we go we talk about in the budget every year. And then the last item on this section is the non-power costs. Like I said, this is everything other than the cost of power. <clears throat> so at the this this sum totals up all these costs above, and then we have to portion out which which chunk uh, 
of these dollars belongs to the residential portion. Um, based on the cost of service study from 2018 or 2019, uh, we, we had a figure of 71%. Uh, we believe that 71% is appropriate for the first three scenarios. The fourth one is probably should be a little bit less because the 71% is strictly the number of meters divided by the entire population of meters. Um, if you're taking, if you're, if you're looking at this scenario, fourth scenario, it probably should be more like 50 or 60% because they don't use as much power as the, the uh, commercial vendor or commercial customers. So then below that, we have the, the dollars that are apportioned to the residential group. And then this billing determinants line, 85,000, that is the number of meters billed per month for the entire year. So we then we take the cost per residential divided by the number of meters per over the year, uh, and it, it produces a, an, a monthly cost per meter um, that would, could these figures that can then be used for determining what our second meter fee should be. Thank you, Matt. It was, was, you, was that what you wanted to go over and or is there more? I just don't want to cut you off. Um, it, well, do you, if you have any questions on, on these figures, now we could probably go over that now. I think there's going to be more discussion. Okay. Um, so the, the billing determinants is if I take the 85,000 and divide by 12, that's the number of meters that are deployed for residents or all meters deployed? All, um, all meters. Okay, but we've applied the 71% to the- Yeah, you're right. Prior. No, it's just it's just it's just residential billing determinants, um, Brian. The eighty five thousand okay, okay. that's basically taking roughly sixty five hundred customers a month times twelve. Um, okay. so it's just the residentials. All right. So so okay. So we're working with like for like. Um, yes. All right, and the scenario for is an interesting reference, but I think everybody is going to key in on that $71 fixed collection, you know, if we were to do full fixed collection, but um, you had said that the 71% should be more like 50% based on the cost, cost of service study from last time. So that $71 is high. Yes. Okay. So I, I just, I wanna make sure the audience knows that it's less than the $71 to do full monthly fixed collection for distribution. Um, so that's a reference, but not not as accurate as, as, as people would like to use it in the future. Um, then the, the scenarios, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see these different scenarios uh, because it's very helpful. Um, it's helpful in, in understanding how much it, 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 it empowers us to make the decision for a second meter, what are we collecting for? Um, I know my view, but I, I wanna make sure I hear from others on their views and, and we have good options to pick from. So thank you. Um, I, I, those are my immediate thoughts. Um, is there anyone, John, from the board that would like to ask some questions? Yeah, just some questions and some comments. I, I guess maybe first in terms of questions. So in terms of scenario two, um, where we're adding in billing costs, to me, that would be appropriate if a second bill was issued. Um, if there isn't a second bill issued, then that to me would suggest, okay, maybe considering billing costs uh, isn't appropriate. Similarly, for energy efficiency costs, uh, I'd be surprised that uh, there is, in fact, kind of a um, uh, an incremental uh, cost associated with you know energy efficiency. So I'm just thinking that those scenarios, is, in similarly scenario four, might be less relevant. One um, methodological comment, just in terms of looking at the uh, annual capital costs, um, it looks like what we did there was take the uh, meter capital costs and divide it by the number of years. That's clearly the depreciation charge. 
but I think what isn't in there would be some of the financing costs. So that might suggest that the number here is uh, is potentially conceivably a little bit low. Yeah. Um, just just some thoughts, but uh, yeah, thanks for sharing this, Matt. Welcome, um, Warren. Yeah. Excuse me. I wasn't at the last meeting, so I'm catching up a little. But I had one question about what we're trying to accomplish here. Up till now, not everybody with second meters has been treated the same. Right. Um, are we now trying to move to a system where everybody with second meters is going to be treated the same? Or are we still going to have differences between how different people are treated, and if so, which is the group that these numbers would apply to? Yeah, that's a that's a good good question. Yeah, that's an so, excellent question. So, do you recall, Warren, that Dave put together a comprehensive list of all of the not all, but a, a number of different scenarios where there are multiple meters? Yes, and they involve different infrastructure. There might be a house that has two meters served by the same transformer, for example. There might be a house that is served by two different transformers with two different line drops. Clearly, there's different distribution, capital, and expenses associated with those two different configurations. We met internally and discussed uh, how difficult it would be to try to quantify for each specific configuration exact and precise costs. Um, and it would also be very confusing to customers to have, you know, six or seven different second meter costs. And so this is why we sort of came to this approach, which is to say, okay, let's give you some frames of reference of the types of costs that the board might consider to be appropriate to assign to a second meter. And I appreciate John Dalton's comments um, about if a second bill is not issued then perhaps the billing costs should not be considered. However, I will say that the bills are made up of uh, different complexities and clearly houses with multiple meters do require additional billing complexity. Um, there are multiple meter reads, for example, that can go wrong. Um, there tend to be more questions to customer service reps from bills that have multiple meters. So you know, maybe it's not 100% of the billing uh, costs, but it seems there are some potential incremental billing costs that might be considered to be appropriate in a second meter charge. Um, I would also like to kind of uh, prioritize the discussion of what do we want to charge if someone has a second meter? And once we've determined what that value is to then have the discussion of, of who does that apply to? Um, because we did go over the who does it apply to in the last meeting, and that was that is pretty complicated. But I think for this discussion, I'd really like to nail down when there are two meter charges, what is the value that we're charging for the second meter? And then we can find in a separate discussion, who are we going to apply the second meter fee to? Um, so I don't want to confuse things. I want to kind of nail down the, the value today. Well, but I mean, you can't simplify it too much. The appropriate value depends on the ty different types of infrastructure that is required to serve that customer. And so for the board to come up with a value, you really do need to understand and, and consider the complexity of the different metering configurations, recognizing that it's probably not realistic to come up with very precise figures for each one because there would just be too many. Correct. Yeah. So um, I, I, are we... is. Does the board feel that they understand the, the values in front of them and the methodology behind them? If anyone doesn't, uh, John, do you have a, you want clarification? Yeah, ju just a, another question here is, um, I'm just wondering, would an alternative methodology that might be a little more precise to look at just the um, per unit uh, meter cost um, so what's the cost of one meter for a residential customer rather than taking the, you know, aggregate meter cost and dividing it by the total number of billing units, or maybe it's a typical residential meter. Just wondering if, if that would be, would provide a, you know, better estimate in terms of the, the cost of uh, a residential meter, recognizing that uh, a residential meter is going to be different than a commercial meter. 
Well, well in the capital cost of the meters, really just one component of the cost the light plant experiences related to the number of meters, right? So I think if we just took the capital cost, which is probably a few hundred dollars, it wouldn't really fully capture um, what the incremental cost is for us to put in an additional meter. That's my view. Yeah, and, and I would also um, add to that that our goal here is to come up with a, a value for a meter fee, not based on a specific meter, but a residential style meter. Uh, be, so I like the fact that we're working in the aggregate because uh, the cost of a, a 320, it was a 320 or 380 amp meter versus you know a smaller meter, there's small variations in the cost there. As, as Laura pointed out, there's costs related to software, to salaries that we put into this model here. So working in the larger numbers allows us to boil down to a single value that's approximate for all. And I think that's a better methodology than having, you know, you've got this type of meter, so you get this second meter fee. And, and that gets very complicated very quickly. So um, I'll I'll share with you my thoughts on on what value I prefer, and I and that's scenario one. Um, scenario one collects for the incremental cost of administering the capital related to the meter, um, and the the point of these discussions is that we currently have residents being charged $18.50 twice. And that is collecting for all of those fixed distribution collection methods that we want. Um, but no single resident should be paying twice for a lot of those categories, but they should be paying twice for having two meters. So I think having an $18.50 uh, 18 charge and then having a, a $5.26 or $5.50 uh, second meter fee uh, for having two meters in their house um, is, is, a, is a good solution to this problem. The, the next, I'll, I'll hold my other comments for our next discussion about who should this apply to, um, but I, I, I wanna hear from the board uh, their thoughts on these different scenarios and, and which one is the best approximate cost for a second meter? Uh, Warren. Well, I wanna raise a philosophical question here on this because I think I'm not necessarily disagreeing with what you're proposing, Brian, but I think it potentially goes against a trend that the board was trying to some folks on the board were trying to implement and that personally I wasn't in favor of. Um, that, that? that there had <laughs> been folks saying that a higher percentage of the fixed cost should be charged customers in fixed payments and not through their um, variable payments for the amount of energy they use. Personally, I don't agree with that philosophy and think that generally low fixed costs make sense and we should be recouping most of our money through the variable energy costs. But if the direction the board is going to is we should be um, recouping more of our money through fixed charges to customers, then I don't see why we wouldn't be applying that to folks who have second meters, because this is what you're proposing is going in the opposite direction, which is saying, let's not worry about recouping all our fixed costs um, for folks who have a second meter. Uh, I, I would disagree with that. I think we are recouping the appropriate fixed costs because these, if you if you if you have a resident that has a meter for their garage and a meter for their house on the same property, we're collecting the same amount, uh, or we're collecting more fixed collection from that customer with two eighteen dollar charges, whereas someone who has 
uh, one meter, but then has their garage wired into that one meter is only paying the $18 and not paying the 30, what is 18 times two? Or, you know, they're not paying the almost $40 a month. So uh, this is to, uh, the person with the second meter would pay the 1850 just like the other customer. But because they have a second meter, they'd pay maybe the $5.26 in scenario one for the additional cost of managing that second meter. Um, and not, it's because today they're collecting twice every month for the fixed portion of distribution that we're collecting. And, I, and that that's a burden I don't think is, is fair to those customers. Brian, yeah, can I, I chime in on that? Yeah. So the, the difference that I'm not hearing uh, come up is the fact that there are two different service line drops. So our distribution expenses are higher there. Um, we have to maintain them. And, and I don't hear that being brought into the conversation. If you're talking about one service drop and they have two meters on the side of the house, one for the garage and one for the house, that's a different scenario. And those are kind of some of the things that I outlined in the last meeting. Um, so I don't think it's just black and white. It's it's much more difficult than that. So um, is there a scenario 1B where the line drop is included, but the 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 costs related to uh, billing are not included? Yeah, we could run the numbers on that. I think one of the things that's important in terms of the billing costs are maintenance charges from our billing providers based on the number of meters connected to the system. So when we're talking about a second meter charge, those billing costs should be included because it's based on the number of meters, not based on the number of parcels. Well, that's that's included in the, the meter maintenance and software, I, I believe. So I believe that's captured and in, in, correct me, uh, Matt, if I'm incorrect. <clears throat> So the um, in scenario one, the seventy nine thousand only includes the software costs related to meters, and then it that that's the main reason why there's an increase between the seventy and the one twenty three, uh, is because then we add in the full weight of the NISC costs annual costs in in the the second scenario. What increases the customer service salaries in scenario two from scenario one? Um, they spend not a whole lot of time on on the meter. You know, we we tried to come up with uh, all the scenarios that they would get phone calls on or or issues they have to deal with, and they spend a lot more time with billing matters than they do with meter matters. But they do they do receive calls. You know. I bill complaints, my meter's not working, that type of thing. So we kind of tried to sparse, uh, disperse those costs. Okay. Um, well, ooh, I, Alice, I, I haven't heard from you. What What are your thoughts on? So, <clears throat> you know, I, we have talked about this probably for two years. And we, I think we keep going around in circles about what our needs and desires are. And the idea that we were going to try to collect all of our fixed costs through the meter charge becomes quite complex when we try to equalize across the entire network of, of meters, a single approach. Um, and we've talked about that changing distribution of fixed versus variable costs being cost neutral to the customer. I come back to the philosophical question of the customer as a shareholder in the corporation, in the, in the light plan. And as a shareholder, we have a share price, we would think of, right? That everyone pays for the fixed cost. And then you have some flexibility and choice around um, the energy use. And hopefully, you know, people who are concerned will do some energy efficiency measures. Um, but when I think about one versus two meters, the customer has very little choice about that. Somebody builds a garage and the only way to bring power is to add another, another uh, not a second line drop, but to have a second meter. So there aren't always those choices 
available to a customer to choose a more economical approach. It's set by the system itself. So that's where I keep running into this conflict about who gets charged or how do we charge. We all still own the light plant. And you know, in, in the best of circumstances, I believe that as an owner, owners all pay an equal share into the fixed cost of, of having electricity provided to us. Very few people understand the nuances that we're talking about of one meter, a sub meter, a second meter, a one drop, a two drop. And that if we could simplify our language so that the customer says, we all own the light plant and this is what it costs to deliver power across our entire community. And if a, if a line goes out in one area of town, we have an equal obligation to repair it as to another area of town that may have higher costs to, to, to you know, deliver the power there. So I, you know, these are all the conversations that we've had over the last two years. So I'm... Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd add to your, your discussion about, you know, the customer not being in complete control of these decisions. Uh, it was, you know, the, the study of uh, multifamily housing and EV implementation with deeded spots it was a recommendation that the garages be individually metered by the light plant. Uh, so that that you know that was the recommendation, but it wasn't it wasn't foreseen that the customer would be getting two eighteen dollar charges at the time as a developer made the property. So, and rewiring is far more expensive than the 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 fees. But you're right about the equal shares. I view that those fixed collection method fees that are in the meter fee as equal shares. And these people are paying two shares when they should be paying one. So uh, what what do you feel, Alice, is an appropriate amount to charge for a second meter? I personally would think about having a single meter charge that covers the cost of the meter. So scenario one, and mm -hmm. that we apportion all of the fixed costs equally across our households so that we're all equal shareholders in the business of running a light plant. And people understand that it's not just a commodity, that this is a service that you pay for at a certain level. Um, yeah. And then at the end, when I look at scenario three, three, I assume that the energy efficiency cost means it's the collection for the CARES budget. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. million dollars, yeah. Right. So we have all agreed over the years that that is a cost that we want to apply across all the town. And that's a residential fee, a per household or per business or per address fee, not a per meter fee, because right. it's a commodity, it's a common good that we are supporting for the, uh, the betterment of the light plant efficiency. So I, I see it a little differently. And maybe I, I probably have changed my views in the last several years of discussing this, but this is where I am today. Yeah, I'm I'm on a similar page. Uh, John, what are you what are your thoughts on uh, the what value should be set for a second fee? Yeah, I mean Alice, thank you for your comments because that really was a useful perspective. I guess um just based on my background, it's I kind of follow the costs and you know, so that to me suggests that um, some kind of hybrid between scenario one and two, accepting Laura's argument that uh, effectively there are additional costs associated with having that second meter. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your argument, Alice, in terms of that in some instances, you know, customers, it's, it's not, they don't make a choice with respect to having a second meter. But I think in some instances, and I don't know all the nuances here, that they are making choices that cause them to need a second meter. Um, so that to me, you know, causes me to think that maybe there's kind of a, a hybrid here somewhere between uh, some allocation of the scenario two cost, so that uh, there's a value somewhere between there. Thank you. Uh, Warren, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I'm in a similar position with John, although, I would phrase it slightly differently. I would think we should be going towards scenario two, um, which seems like it's capturing the clear additional costs, 
but I question all the numbers in scenario two, whether they should all be in there. You know, that I like the concept of scenario two, but if I were to do it, I would maybe come up with a number that's somewhat less than is there because I think we're maybe charging more in terms of the customer service salary, for example, and the administrative salary than we should to those folks. And and I would summarize my thoughts as being very similar to the three of you. Um, I, I feel that, you know, collecting twice for cares is, is <clears throat> inappropriate in, in what we're doing today. Um, but I feel that the 526 scenario one, um, as Dave pointed out, it doesn't cover the line drop um, in that scenario, but I feel scenario two is, is collecting for a bit too many categories. Um, so I, I'd like to do a straw poll with the board about uh, a decision here. If it was an arbitrary 650, for a second meter that's a, roughly halfway between scenario one and scenario two. Um, would would the board be in favor of a second meter fee of, of that value? It's, I think it, we're looking at this as a, uh, these are like, that's a different question than the one we're dealing with. You're okay. looking for a midpoint on the cost. You know, what is that extra dollar and a half get you other than more revenue for that second meter I, I think our question really is how are we defining what should be embedded in that cost not assume a random multiplier that's halfway well, between the two places without identifying exactly the cost that that's related to yeah so what i'm trying to avoid alice is is punting to another meeting for more analysis <laughs> so i i i you know i ultimately would like that pure calculation that includes the line drop value, some of the additional maybe software values that are in scenario two that aren't in one. Um, but I don't want to ask staff to go back yet again, because this has been going on for quite a while. And these customers every month are paying to, you know, almost $40 a month in these fixed charges. So I would like to come up with a value so we can get on to the second question of who does this apply to and how do we deal with it retroactive retroactively for for how long this decision is taken to make I, so i understand that's what you want to do i'm just suggesting that's a random number we could have it chosen is. 725 or 780 you know whatever Correct. that number is and so when we talk about assigning a random number we've just done all this analysis that gives us options that are quite uh, justifiable each yeah. one of these that you can explain to a customer what is embedded in their cost. A random assignment of a per meter charge it's, doesn't allow us to do that. And we're saying, well, we're trying to be good guys. Yeah, I know. It doesn't bode well. I, I agree with you, but I'm I'm trying to conclude at some oh. point a decision. So hey, would Brian, you rather? You know, I, I just say, um, you know, given we have another we do want to get through this topic, but we have another meeting coming up soon. I wonder if we could just say that it's the sense of the board that looking at this, the number should be somewhere between probably six and seven dollars and that we'd like the um, staff of the light plant to look again at which numbers they have in scenario two should stay there and can they come up with a rationale that maybe puts somewhat less of those numbers in in that scenario knowing that it'll end up somewhere between six and seven but it'll do what alice is suggesting of being based on analysis rather than just picking a number out of a hat Okay. So can I just make a comment on yes. Alice's? I think, Alice, you are economically correct. Like we want a number that's justified by exactly the costs incurred. The problem is that because of the many different scenarios, there are different costs for each yeah. scenario. And if we've all agreed we're not going to have eight different second meter fees, 
we are going to have to do some type of averaging or selection because we're trying to just get to one simple number that customers can understand. And also the precision, precision with which these numbers you see before you are prepared are in themselves somewhat estimates because we don't track, for example, the customer service reps hours that precisely. It's not like they have you know, 20 different buckets that every five minutes they have to put in and say, oh, well, that phone call was about this and this phone call was about that. So there are estimates already embedded in these numbers. So I don't think you should feel, you know, terrible about mishmashing them together the way some have proposed um, because we are trying to simplify and because they're, they are based on estimates themselves. So, um, Alice, do you feel if if I was to ask staff to justify a number between six and seven dollars based on the the discussion today and have a 10 minute discussion on the 13th of September to do a vote, uh, do you feel you'd be prepared to to vote on that number? Oh, I think you're muted. My preference now would be to vote. Um, and I, mine would be on scenario one, where there's a defined cost. And then we spread the cost of NISC across our, our customer base, because that's a that's a service that you we are applying to everyone. Yeah, and, and the, second line, the second line drop as well. Um, OK, so trying to get a, a firm conclusion to what value we should place on this. Um, Warren and John, would you be willing to agree to scenario one at the $5 and 26 cents? I'm not enthusiastic about that. Okay. Because, I mean, it does seem like we have heard that for a lot of these folks with these extra meters, there are additional costs to the light plant mm -hmm. beyond just the cost of the meter. All right. So um I, i'm John, on the same I'm mind wrong. you're I'm the same i'm mind. on the same mind as Warren. all right uh and so alice have you become more comfortable with an arbitrary six dollars and fifty cents <laughs> i i i'm not going to hold up a, a vote on this and if i gave you my opinion and my philosophy behind it i don't okay. think we all have to be in a hundred percent agreement on our approach but right. i'm fine with a, you know a random number if that's what the board feels is yeah. appropriate i I mean, okay. So uh, feel free to vote no. I'm I'm okay with no votes and not. I don't need unanimous from everyone. Uh, John, do you mind making a motion because I can't do it as chair uh, for making setting the fee at six dollars and fifty cents, uh, and we'll see how the vote goes. Yeah, I move that the uh, the fee for a second meter uh, for residential customers be set at six dollars and fifty cents. Uh, Warren, do you mind giving a second? I'll second. All right. Um, uh, John, your thoughts, yes or no? Uh, yeah. Uh, Warren? Yes. Uh, Alice? So I'm going to vote yes. And I have to say why, though. Okay. In listening to Laura's explanation that these numbers are somewhat imprecise on their own, the 526 to me is as good a number as 650 is, given that the precise number cannot be derived. And it's a small increment, so 650 to me for a second meter seems okay. Okay. And and, and thanks I, for your explanation, Laura. That was really helpful to hear about that, yeah. how precise these numbers actually are. Yeah, and, and I would agree as well. Um, so I, I the board has made a decision that a second meter fee will be valued at $6.50. We still have two remaining questions, which is who does this apply to? Uh, and also what do we do with the people who have been overcharged for, for quite some time? So uh, let's see where we are in time, uh, 8.30. I, I would like to pick up those two topics. Um, you know, who does the second meter fee apply to and how do we deal with those that have been receiving two meter fees uh, at our next meeting on the September 13th.
And with that, Brian, yes, before you move on with those two things for the next meeting, <clears throat> do you want us to um, propose who the 650 applies to based on the scenarios that we already put together? Yes, I would. Okay. And um, I would also like to know the, the estimated cost to go back and credit customers that have been charged these second fees. Um, the difference between being charged the 650 and the 1850. Uh, you know, how many months have they been getting two two fees, and what is that total up to? So that we know uh, what the 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 you know to credit customers for this change retroactively. So I, I, I don't would... know that we're going to have enough time to get that stuff put together for the next meeting, because you're talking about a lot of data to go through in terms of who it applies to and what the back charges are in your I, I would also say, Brian, I wouldn't look at it that way. Um, you, you kind of phrasing this as they've been overcharged. I would say, you know, the board had a certain philosophy about how second meters were going to be charged and the board I, has changed their philosophy. We don't, when we go and put a new rate in, we don't go back and retroactively uh, change what the rate had been previously. That was the rate that was in effect. And I don't think we should set a precedent of I, we set a new rate retroactively going back and trying to recalculate. I think that would be a big mistake. I, I disagree. Uh, I don't think it was the board that did that decision. It was uh, a policy that the staff felt was in place. No, it's, that's no. I mean, that's not true. Not to prolong this, but in every scenario, there's always more than one option, and in many cases the contractor does what's the uh, most cost effective for them during construction, and they don't really care about the end customer. So we had both scenarios where we tell them you can do it this way or you can do it this way and they decide. It's not always us saying do it this way. So that's, that is mischaracterized a little bit. I uh, will we'll disagree on that one. Um, I, I feel that these customers, I, I I don't want to go into it here. We can talk about this uh, at, at offline, um, but I, I I don't agree with that. Uh, Warren. Yeah, I was basically going to agree with what Laura said. I don't think we should characterize anybody having been overcharged. Those were the rates that were in place. Now, the board could decide that they want to do something for a certain class of customers but it's not because they were being overcharged. They were being charged the rates that were in effect at the time. I agree. All right, and John, John's giving that. All right, I, I'm clearly in the minority on this one. So, um, all right, uh, for the next meeting, uh, we will not do the analysis for crediting. As the, the board generally, agree with that i want to make sure i understand your views uh, i got yes. some nodding i i do i do agree with that um and yeah i okay we were collecting the cost of, of what it takes to run the light plant in the best way that we thought we could do at the time and now we're looking at a different and better methodology that apportions those same costs it's the same cost is how they're distributed across the same number of customers Give or take. Uh, John just put down his I was just about to go to you because your hand was up. Oh. Um, <laughs> all right. So for the for the next meeting, we're going to focus on the question of who does this charge apply to. All right. So uh, Pamela, we're going to hold public comments until the end. We're we're running behind schedule on the agenda. Um. So. Our next topic on the agenda is uh, CMLP 2022 audited financials. Uh, do you, Dave, who would you like to take this? Yeah, so Matt's going to do this. You should have received a copy of the um, 2022 audited financials from uh, Melanson and Heath. Um, so hopefully you had a chance to review them. And Matt's going to kind of go through the summary of it. Uh, okay. So this is this presentation is going to look familiar if you've if you've seen this before, um, I'm just going to kind of go through the the format of the the financial statements, and then uh, point out a few few uh, numbers that I think here are important. Um, I want to point out first there was a couple letters that 
uh, accompanied with the financial statements. The first one is called the governance letter. Um, I don't really know why they split this out into a separate letter because there's also a, a an independent auditor report inside the financial statements that does this, essentially the same thing. So um, I don't really understand the purpose of this, but it's just required communication to those in governance of the, the light plant. Uh, the second letter is the same as last year. We had no findings that warranted uh, communication. We had no, uh, sorry, no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that required uh, communication with, with uh, those in charge. So um, it's a no finding management letter. And then moving on to the financial statements, uh, I'm going to be referring to page numbers, and this is going to be the page number at the bottom of the page and not the PDF page, if you're following along. So I'm going to start on page one. This is the independent auditors report. Um, this is the thing where I, I don't know why they split the letter out and didn't just combine it all into this, this part, but um, this this section is also gives the opinion of the financial statements. We received a clean opinion, uh, which we've always we've always had a clean opinion as far as I'm aware. Um, so that means that these it's a clean clean audit report essentially. Uh, moving on to page four is the management discussion and analysis. This is a good place if you don't really want to read the, the whole financial statements, but want a kind of high level view overview of what's going on. It explains the, how the financial statements work and kind of uh, has digs into uh, a little bit of the high level uh, results for the year. <clears throat> Moving on to page eight, which is the statement of net position. This is also similar to the balance sheet for a for-profit company. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I want to point out is in years past, we've shown two years of finance. We would have shown 2022 and 2021 uh, figures. We couldn't do that this year because we implemented a new GASB, which was GASB 87, which is the lease standard. Um, as a result, you'll notice that there's a couple new numbers in the financial statements. Uh, this lease receivable, long-term and short-term lease receivables, as well as a um, deferred inflow of resources. It didn't really change anything. The bottom line stays exactly the same. It just splits out uh, an asset and a liability, essentially. Um, the other thing I want to point out, uh, cash overall went up about a million from the prior year, which is good and healthy. We do need to spend down some of our restricted cash still, but that'll be coming pretty, pretty shortly. Um, AR was also up, but that's kind of uh, expected based on um, our higher usage at the end of the year as well as uh, higher rates per uh, you know per per uh, kilowatt hour, so that, that's kind of an, uh, what we expected. Um, <clears throat> the last item I wanted to point out is this unearned revenue. This I'll talk about on the next page, but it's related to the provision for rate refund. That balance went up, meaning we owe more back to the customers. Um, <clears throat> so we will see that on the next page as well. Uh, page nine, the statement of revenues, expenses, and change in net position. This is similar to an income statement for a for-profit company. Um, I mentioned the uh, rate refund, provision for rate refund on the prior page. This is, so we charge more for energy for 2022 than we, um, than, than it cost us. So we now owe money back to the customers. And that's why the liability went up and it shows a negative revenue here. Um, for 2023, we're planning to draw that down. So this will actually add, this will, this will flip to a positive number, hopefully for 2023, offsetting uh, rate hikes for 2023. <clears throat> um, the other thing I wanna point out is, I think we're all aware the electric sales figure and cost of power figures are considerably higher than the year before. That I, I'm pretty sure we all knew, you know, due to the cost of power rising, we raised rates. We also 
added the uh, PCAs on for the for 2022. Um, and then um, down towards the bottom, the change in that Matt, position. Can, oh, can, yep. can, can, can I ask a question? Just going back to the um, the uh, renewable energy certificate revenue. Yeah. Um, being new to the board, I, I guess I just don't understand kind of um, the light plants practice with respect to uh, RECs. So are we basically selling S RECs and uh, buying, you know, class one RECs or something like that? I'm just trying to understand what's happening here. So no, we added, oh. Yeah, why don't we Laura talk? Sorry. I was just going to say, um, we are uh, increasing the amount of energy that we buy that is comes with associated RECs, so direct purchases of wind and solar. Uh, we are cleaning up, if you will, that portion of electricity that we're unable to buy directly from renewable resources by purchasing additional non-associated Massachusetts class one RECs. So we uh, collect for what it's gonna cost to buy those additional RECs and then we turn around and spend it, always exactly the same. So if we collected 3.373 million in um, on people's bills, we're going to spend 3.373 million buying those RECs and other renewable energy. In in Laura, was, oh, go ahead. sorry, it was it was the result, John, of a board decision to increase the amount of renewable energy without rate shock. We said we're going to set aside a certain amount of money every year to buy RECs, and we're going to let the volume of those RECs float with the market because the price of RECs goes up and down. So instead of saying we're going to hit, you know, 27% renewable or 50% or 75%, which would have had an unknown cost every year, we said we're basically going to make like an allowance. And then we're going to go spend that allowance and buy as many RECs as we can. And in 2022, we were able to buy 99% of sales. And this year, we think that we will buy, we believe pretty firmly that we're 100% of our sales are going to come from non-carbon emitting, and we will have extra in that allowance, which will enable us, if the board chooses, to then lower the, the power rates because we're or we're collecting enough. Yeah. And, Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank and, you. In, in, that, um, in that collection, John, it, the board also decided that that money could be used towards a project, a renewable project, if we wanted. So right now we're using it solely for RECs, but if a project came up in we wanted to buy into it, we could use the funds for that as well. Great. Thank you. Very helpful. And Laura, that collection is still at two cents per kilowatt. Yes. Okay. Matt is shaking his head. Yes. Great. And, and that, the, that's that how we two, come up with the allowance. The, the, the two cents is in with the energy charge, and um, we just split it out so that it's more visible to financial statement users. And I can I can send a memo out uh, to the board as a reminder of what was voted on years ago for this, so you get a little bit of the background as well. And uh, it'd be helpful in that memo to kind of highlight when we made the increases because we started at one penny, and then we went to a penny and a half, and then we went to two, and uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, sorry, Matt, for 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 the diversion, but it was it was well well it was a good diversion. So um, yeah, no no worries. If stop me if I'm I'm probably going too fast anyway. So uh, if you have a question, just chime in. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover on this page was the change in net position. This is our net income for the year. Uh, we had budgeted about a half million between both companies for the year, and ended up being almost a million more than that. Um, I went in and looked and kind of compared the these figures to the budget figures, and it looked like we over budgeted for the energy efficiency program by about two hundred thousand. Um, we over budgeted for admin salaries by about about hundred thousand, and the um, the pension was over about a three hundred thousand. So uh, a couple of those, I'm not really sure how we went so far over on cares, but the um, the other two items were kind of expected. Um, it's hard to estimate what the admin salaries will be. And then the pension, 
it all depends on the ebbs and flows of the actuarial statements and that type of thing in our plan assets and all that type of stuff. So um, pretty, I, I would say pretty good. We're, we, we will see below where within our 8% rate of return, and this is a very healthy return. So I think I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the results. And, and if I remember correctly, Matt, our return uh, from 2020, 2020 or 2021 was negative yeah yeah so this is this is kind of a overcorrection, uh but you know over over a five-year view this is probably balancing out to that two percent target correct two to three percent is it a three percent target two to three two to three range two to three yes two and a half <laughs> okay usually closer to two but yeah a little buffer in there uh, the next page, page 10, is the statement of cash flows. Um, it, I don't know why most people would have any use to, to look at this. Um, if I can talk you through it if you'd like. But uh, moving on to page 11 are the notes of the financial statements. Um, this gives a pretty, this is where you're going to go. If you really want to go in depth on a certain line item or topic, this is where it's going to be. Um, it gives a breakdown of the plant, all the, you know, chapter 164, all that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> talks about the basis of accounting and what goes into how they figure the numbers of, above in the financial statements. A um, couple of things I wanted to point out are the, uh, we've talked about on page 14, the rate of return, the plant must uh, must be within 8%. And they're saying that we are, are within our, our 8% of, it is uh, obligated by the state, state law. Um, down to page 17, this lease receivable, this is a new, based on the new uh, GASB 87 that we just implemented. This is a new uh, <clears throat> disclosure. Um, there's a lot of information here. If you'd like to read through it, uh, I just wanted to point out that that's new compared to last year. Um, page 21, we don't talk about debt too much, so I thought I'd hit it. Um, this, this is a chart of our, where we, where we sat last year at the end of, at the beginning of 2022 and where we sit at the end, we started with 3.2 million in bonds outstanding. And now we are down to 2.6. Um, our pension liability actually flipped over into an asset. So that that's part of that, uh, reduction in costs that we saw, uh, compared to the budget. And then our OPEB liability actually went up. I'm not really sure why that was, but we can see that below in the in the OPEB, um, probably due to some sort of fluctuation or change in discount rate. <clears throat> and then the last thing I wanted to hit was page 35. Um, this is the last page of the notes. The um, the the 25th note is um, related to, talks about the GASB, implementing GASB 87. And then we also have this new one coming out next year, GASB 96, which is similar to leases, but it's uh, subscription-based IT arrangements, which I believe will affect us as well as the town, the IT department at the town will have a lot of stuff that pertains to this. So there'll be a whole new set of things coming out next year. Um, and then I'm going to skip through. There's some, a few more pages in between uh, required supplementary information, but I'm not going to talk about that. If you go down to page 40, it starts the combined. The it's the same financial statements as above, but they, it show it breaks out the light plant from the broadband or telecom, so you can see more detail down below if you if you're if you're curious. And um, that is all I had to show. Is, are there any questions? Um, I I have a question about the debt. Um, so I think it's page 20 or 21. Right here. Yep. And this is for 2022, but this this does not forecast any uh, debt from the, the solar project at the middle school, correct? Correct. So no. this, this will increase based on that project for next year. As well as the meter project 
Right. Oh, the meter project, uh, the AMS system isn't represented here or a portion Correct. of it? It, it. Yeah, that we're, we're planning to, I believe we're going to uh, go and go out for debt in uh, at the next budget cycle. So May, I think it's usually May. Yep. And you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, forecasted debt in the budget in the upcoming budget. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. Right. Um, are there any other questions from uh, the board? Uh, John. Yeah, Matt, just another question for me. I'm just trying to understand um, the limit in terms of the 8% return. I think that was framed in terms of like a cost. I'm assuming that's an 8% return on what would effectively be the net uh, book value of assets. Is that right? So yeah, they take the uh, it's they take the net book value of your capital, your your entire plant, and and whatever eight percent that's your limit. There's a couple. There's some discrepancy on on the calculation, but there's a couple things you take in and out of that number, but it's essentially that. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Um, other questions? Seeing none, Matt, do you feel you've covered everything? I do. All right, great. Well, let's go on to the smart meter project. Uh, and Dave, who would you, oh, um, we're going to take, we're running behind on the agenda. So I'm going to have to take public comment, Mark, at the end. I will get back to you, though. Uh, Dave. Uh, for the topic of smart meters, who would you like to to do this? I'll take it. Okay. So I figure it's been a little bit since we've um, given an update on where we are with the project. And um, so I figured we'd give a summary and uh, go from there. So I mentioned previously that all the gateways are installed. That's part of the networking uh, portion. Um, so all the field gateways have been installed. We've been testing them. Um, they're reporting back properly. We did order a spare gateway um, as part of the project, and we have that currently installed at uh, one of our substations um, for testing purposes. Uh, we have a meter installed out there. Um, we did internally discuss um, uh, purchasing a second spare, and the reason being is the lead times on these things are lengthy, and if we have a storm come through and one gets taken down, we won't have another spare. So we're going to have two spares when we're all said and done. Um, so we'll we'll build that when it comes in, test it, and have it ready to go. Um, so that that's good. Um, the testing of the network has gone well, um, so things are working um, as intended. Um, NISC and Eaton are working uh, still, tweaking um, the metering infrastructure and the way that the two softwares communicate with one another. We're about ninety percent done with that, so um, that's good. You know, we had a little slowdown um, because. We had a project manager um, take on a different role at Eaton and a new project manager come in. And so um, Carol's done a good job of making sure to get them back on track. Um, she's actually on a meeting with them right now. So that's why you don't see her on here. Um, um, so they're about 90% done with that, which is good. Um, uh, Eaton's gonna be here next week um, to do some training and um, we're gonna install 10 meters. Uh, out in the system, and um, we're excited about that, um, especially since they're going to be here. They can help us with any quirks that we don't know about and, you know, go through the training. Um, we've contacted the 10 customers um, that we selected in our, our deployment area uh, by phone, and if they didn't uh, return the phone call, we emailed them as well. Um, to make sure there was no um, issues with us replacing their meter, whether they had a home Zoom meeting or something. Um, that's one of the challenges we really feel we're going to face going forward as we schedule more deployments. We're going to have more people saying, I can't do it today because I have a home meeting or whatnot. So I think we're going to have some challenges that we haven't had in the past um, just because of remote work, but uh, we'll work through those. Um, in those 10 installations, we've selected a variety of different um, types of customers. We have a load management customer, you know, solar customer. Uh, hot water controlled customer, that sort of thing. So we tried to get a good flavor of what our residential customers are 
so that we can start going through the process to seeing how the rates work with the existing rates work within the system and so that we you know are are ready to go when we um, start deploying on a much larger scale to that the much larger scale is not going to happen like in three weeks so we're going to get these first 10 done uh, start educating the team on how it works and then the metering team will start the deployment for a month and once we get all the bugs kinked out you know then we'll take um, and have a larger deployment group uh, utilizing the line crew as well but we want to make sure that we ha have everything going so that we don't do an install and have 30 issues that we didn't identify beforehand. So kind of more of a slow start at the beginning and then a more rapid install. Um, we are, um, you know, six weeks behind on when we thought we were going to be deploying. Um, and that's based on the you know, two software, um, you know, NIC and Eaton working together to, to get that stuff uh, finished up. But like I said, they're 90% done. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, we have uh, about 6,500 residential meters in stock in the warehouse, ready to go. Um, and the commercial meters are still, last we checked, scheduled to come in by the end of the year. Um, so haven't heard that that's not the case. So that's a good thing. Um, we have received all of the load management devices, and those are in the warehouse as well. When we start the installation of load management devices, that's going to be a little bit more involved because we have to get into the homes, um, test the circuits to make sure they're still connected to the load management devices. So it's scheduling appointments with customers and there's around 550 of those. So transitioning to load management customers, whether it be ETS, hot water, you know, anyone that has a load control device is gonna take a little bit more time. All that work will be done internally by our electrician. Um, so, you know, we'll have really one installer on a load management um, upgrade. Um, we have training coming up in September on uh, the 12th to the 14th for staff. Um, so that kind of ties in pretty well with, you know, start our deployment, go to the next phase, you know, have training in, in the middle of that, and then um, go further into it. Um, and then, uh, let's see, one of the things that um, is exciting, at least for me, you guys may not think so, but um, we have uh, three field tools. Two of them are ours. One's um, the water departments. We, when we take those field tools out in the uh, field, we can actually uh, GPS the meter locations and it'll tie right in with our mapping system. And so that's a, a very big benefit for us because we uh, beforehand had to do that manually to go to each customer's house, figure out where the meter was, and then put it on the maps. This will tie it right into the maps. And likewise, when they're deployed, they'll also respond back to the OMS or the outage management system when they're out. So um, some some good stuff coming and we're, we're excited about it. Um, and we're working through the different ways to do the installation. You can do it with the field tool, you can do it with a tablet. You know, those are some of the things that I was talking about. We have to figure out what's gonna work best for our team um, when we deploy, but, um, you know that that was um, that was good. So, um, other than that, I think that's really all the big topics on the smart meter at this point. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, so it's great. You, the ten customers is the uh, the first customers you're going to actually put these meters on. You've picked a good variety. You're going to troubleshoot with them and learn with them. Um, and then I believe the next is the pilot of the of a certain area of town. Right. Uh, and then then it's going to continue to grow from there um, all the way along, making sure that we're we're learning and we're finding and we're not trying to do it all at once and doing the same problem a hundred times. We do it one time, fix, find a solution, and then we do it right for the next ninety nine correct. and and you know, we've identified the area we want to start in. Mm -hmm. and the um, so we're starting up in the border road area and the idea there is to work out from there um, to get to Nathan Pratt, which is the 350 units up behind the substation. We have a lot of activity up there in terms of move in, move out. And, um, you know, we really want to get that system on um, that area on the system first 
So that's why we selected that area and the pilot will come in that area as well. One of the things worth noting on the pilot, you know, in past we've gone out and requested customers that were interested in uh, signing up for the pilot. We can't do that on this one because we have to build from the gateways out. And so if we have a customer on Lexington Road that wants to be part of the pilot and they're not close to a gateway, it won't communicate. So we got to do the pilot in a set area and then work our way out. And once we get going, um, we'll be able to work in multiple locations in town, but a little different criteria on this one. Right. Uh, any other questions on the update from the board members? Seeing none, um, I'm I'm very happy with the progress this project is making. I know it may be a few weeks behind from the software, um, you know, communication standpoint, but it's still great to see that we're doing it step by step. We're we're hitting the milestones. We're we're making forward progress. Um, so, and excellent. the good thing is, is the team has done a really good job here of managing the inventory. You know, sixty five hundred meters. It's all they're all internally housed really organized things and um, done a fabulous job with that. The last piece that um, I should share is so far, we have 20 customers that have put in for an opt out of a smart meter, okay. uh, which is a small number. We do expect that to be uh, up around 100 is what we um, anticipated. Um, so, you know, we have some and, and that's okay, um, but it's not a large number. Right, and um, that that prompts the other the other question of the process we have for opt out, where there with the analog meters, um, is that process coming along, and and do you feel confident in installing those today, or is that coming in a, a future milestone? No, we we have a process in place for that already. Okay, so people who wanted to opt out. Um, and get a non non Wi-Fi communicating meter could do that today. Yep. Great. And it sounds like about 20 people um, are interested in it. All right. Um, seeing no other hands raised from the board with questions, um, I am willing to move on to liaison and public comments. I know that Pamela Dritt and Mark also had comments which were delayed till now. Mark, what would you like to ask? Hi, yeah, I have a uh, request. One of my responsibilities on the select board is to chair the uh, financial audit advisory committee and you just covered your audit report. And Wendy was the light board rep to that committee before. And I don't know if you've named a new rep and would just like to uh, uh, encourage you to do so if you haven't and let me know who it is if you have. Yes, so Bianca, um... I've already talked to um, and we'll be doing that role, um, but I haven't done the follow-up of getting her set up and going. So uh, thank you for the reminder. I'll, I'll get on that. Okay, great. I just would need her contact information. At some point, um, it's a responsibility of that, that board to take a look at all of the town's audited audit reports and, and go through them. Um, and actually to that end, it'd be useful for, for me to get a copy of, of the report so I could take a look at it. I, I will forward you that email. Appreciate it. Uh, Gail, you have a public comment. I do. Thank you. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Video. I wasn't sure if you guys are doing that now. Um, good morning. Um, so my comment today pertains to the CMS solar project. Um, as I mentioned at the February forum um, that that you, Brian, led um, regarding the solar project of the middle school. And I also mentioned it at a town meeting, solar panel installations often cause electrical noise in the wiring. And this is called also called or known as electromagnetic interference. And this can have harmful health effects to a building's inhabitants. Um, and because this is a school full of children, I'm particularly concerned about um, proper design so fortunately, EMI can be analyzed and mitigated, and I've been in touch with a firm that specializes in this practice. Um, and I'd like to know when the light board could make some time um, in your busy schedule to learn more about this important problem and the possible solutions. So I, I think you know, 10 or 15 minutes would be great. And I'd just like to get on an agenda at some appropriate time. 
Yeah. So I, I received your email last night and um, I haven't had a chance to talk to Dave and, and uh, review this. So uh, I will get back to you um, later this week or, or early next week. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Pamela Dritt. Hi, uh, Pamela, 13 Concord Green. Um, thank you for, uh, is it, I have a bunch of questions, but I know that we have a fund to finance the purchase of the RECs and to balance rate fees so that it, they don't get too high uh, suddenly. Uh, can you have a fund to finance programs like uh, heat pump incentives, solar and battery storage incentives, EV incentives, um, all electric construction? Could, could we make a lower energy price rate level for all electric residences. Mm -hmm. um, could we have an, an exception for a second meter charge at all for um, residences who need it in order to um, charge an EV because there's no other way to do it? So I, I know simplicity, the same price for everything and everyone sounds it's sort of like a flat tax it sounds fair but it really isn't fair um especially so, fixed costs so uh we we do have that on the agenda for next week to talk about uh the second meter and who it applies to uh the special rate that you just requested um is what we're moving away from uh, but that does not mean that we can't do some kind of uh, bill credit. So it would be a separate line item that says you're getting this credit for this device, similar to um, uh, the, the current EV miles program. But we are the time of use that we are looking at would have off-peak rates that would be favorable for charging devices like an EV. So in in the the idea of the time of use, as you know, is to be an encompassing rate and is to reflect when it costs more or less to use power. So it's not an incentive rate. That is what we're moving away from. Um, so I, I think you know the answer to this question. So I, I think that's the best summary I can give you right now. Well, um, are we considering residential solar installations as competition? Because no. we need to incentivize those. We we give rebates. We we encourage solar. Um, so I don't see it as 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 competition. But that's that's. Do do we have a a incentive for battery storage, residential battery storage installations? Not yet, but we we only have maybe ten home battery systems in town. So. Um, it, it's it's something that I feel the board would like to do, but we've got a lot on our plate, and uh, and that's that's something that you know we we put towards future years. Well, if, time of if use we do, will, Pamela, time of use rates will be financial incentives for batteries. Batteries will be able to make right. money with the new time of use rates. True. Yeah, that good point. Um, will we be able with the new meter system? to um, create, when we get a bunch of batteries, a virtual power plant. Uh, Again, that's, that's a good suggestion that is on our radar, but we'll, we'll bring it up later. No, well, I, I mean, does it, in, does it need the meters to, to do that or is yes. that a separate system? No, the, we need full deployment of AMS before we do any kind of, um, virtual power plant concepts because that's right now staff is very busy with deploying the meters uh, and getting that up and solid and running uh, just like with the billing system it took a, a year or two to get that deployed and, and stable before we could take on the a AMS system so yes uh, there is a timeline for projects that the light plant is working on in the strategic plan page uh, which will give you some idea of when for a lot of your questions. 
Can we please have a spot where the public has access to your packet of information? Yeah, I, I'm s sorry about that. I received uh, the packet um, late yesterday. So, uh, but there I, isn't any, I mean, it I, I agree with you every month because I want to see the things last month too. Uh, uh, I think we've, we've talked about this in, in past meetings. I'll talk with Dave uh, later this week about how we could do that. Just just put a link, put it on the website and put a link in the agenda. And that would be great. great. All right. I'm mm -hmm. going to I'm going to go to Phil. Uh, Phil, you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, with the uh, the uh, Hawaii uh, firestorm fresh in our minds, um, I wonder if, if you could add to a, a future agenda. Um, just a discussion about how the um, channel manager um, and light, the light board is thinking about planning for extreme weather impacts on the grid. I know there's a long-term uh, plan to, to move um, from above ground to below ground, but likewise, below ground has drawbacks such as flooding risk. So uh, for a, a just request for a future meeting, um, just update uh what what the how the, the board is, is thinking about planning for extreme weather events thank you great thank you phil um and yes that's a that's a good topic i know that uh the climate board is is kind of focused on resiliency recently as well so we'll uh we'll take that into consideration and, and i'll talk to dave any other public comments Seeing none, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. In a second. I, I see. I see. Warren raised his hand for a second. Uh, so Alice. Yes. John. Yes. And Warren. Yes. And I agree as well. Thank you all for for coming out this morning. Have a good day. Bye now.